So I'm very happy to be with you today and I'm very pleased that the San Francisco Dharma Collective um, came into being and continues to thrive. And I um, also, just to say a little bit about who I am and where I'm at, it's, uh, I'm, I am one of the nuns who was part of um, starting a Loka Vihara in San Francisco, and I had been training in England before that, and before that in America, and I became a bhikkhuni in 2012 and started Karuna Buddhist Vihara, which is now located in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the Redwood Forest. So we are uh, living our our uh, forest holy life out here off the grid uh, next to the creek, which right now is dry and we're hoping for rain like many, many people are. And we are very close uh, to the Aloka Vihara sisters and we do a lot of things together. So of course we were uh, closely watching what was happening for them with the fire as they were last year when we evacuated here you start to get used to fire behaviors and having your bags packed and all of those things. And it's funny because when you get more, um, what do I want to say, not just used to things, but informed, then it's not so scary. Anyway, we, we understood how they were feeling and glad that they landed in a really nice place in Sacramento. And when they came back, um, they found that you know all their their main buildings were as they left them and 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 fine and there were fire trucks on their meadow still firefighters mopping up uh, because uh, the fire had covered some good portion of the land there at aloka vihara and their new kuti burnt down and their one of their yurts burnt down and in case you haven't heard about those things, but that's um, small compared to any kind of threat of life or even the um, the main buildings being uh, having been defended by the firefighters. Is tremendous gratitude for the firefighters and other first responders also here uh, when we went through the similar kind of thing last year. We were lucky that the fire stayed five miles away, so not nearly as similar. Um, as we had hoped it would be for the Aloka Vihara Monastery, but I'm glad that they've come through it. And of course, it's a tremendous reminder of impermanence and how um, it's good to be solid in the Dharma and ready for whatever might arise in our life. And so I think um, you're, you know, later when we have questions, Q and A, you're welcome to ask me about anything in case there's something in that intro that you want to know more about. I think that we will start with the refuges and precepts, the way that the Aloka Vihara bhikkhunis generally do, and. Um, I guess I have the power to share also, and I have it right here in front of me. Do you want me to do that, Noam, or do you have it prepared also? E either way, I can share if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, Noam. <coughs> can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So why don't we just, uh, everybody else will be muted, but chant along. We'll just do this all all together. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udhang Saranang Chami, Damang Saranang Chami, Sanghang Saranang Chami, 
Dutiampi putang saranga chami. Dutiampi damang saranga chami. Dutiampi sanghang saranga chami. Tatiampi putang saranga chami. Tatiampi damang saranga chami. Tatiampi sanghang saranga chami. And then these are the five precepts. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Okay, so I think we'll start with some meditation. And find a comfortable position. I think it'll probably be around 35, 40 minutes, something like that. And then I'll offer Dhamma reflection. And we can have a discussion, I hope. So I'm gonna offer some guidance. I'm setting my timer so that I don't lose track of time <laughs> or I can lose track of time. <laughs> So this meditation will be uh, based on mindfulness of in and out breathing, the instructions that the Buddha gave for working with our breath, calming our mind, and actually fulfilling the four foundations of mindfulness and the seven factors of enlightenment. So we begin by sitting with our spine straight. Of course, it doesn't always have to be a sitting posture. It can be lying down or standing. Just so the spine is straight and the body can relax and not be tense. And we establish mindfulness. And notice what that instruction does to the mind. We place our attention on our breathing. Aware that we're breathing in when we're breathing in. And aware that we're breathing out when we're breathing out. And in the beginning, if the mind is busy or even if it's kind of dull, then we might even have the words in breath and out breath arise in the mind. This to help us become focused on our breathing. And throughout this meditation, we'll have an awareness that we're breathing in when we're breathing in and aware awareness that we're breathing out when we are breathing out. 
something we're often are really almost never aware of as we're going through our day. But our focus on our breath provides an anchor, a foundation, a support for the calming of the body and mind. And the Buddha encouraged us to notice whether our breath is light or heavy, short or long. So is that in breath deep or shallow, long or short? And the same with the out breath. And it helps us to take an interest in the breath and it helps us to follow it all the way until it finishes. We notice the in-breath until it comes to the point where there's that turn and it becomes the out-breath. And also when we ask questions or we inquire or take notice of qualities, we are deepening our mindfulness we observe from that place of mindfulness. And you'll notice as you sit and observe the breath that it changes. And that's all right. We just observe, perhaps we are calming down more and our breath becomes more shallow, softer, shorter. And however it is, we are observing it. We feel the in-breath traveling in to the body, spreading through the body, and the out-breath leaving the body. And in that, we can invite the body to relax. And at this point, the Buddha encourages that we open our awareness to include the whole body and we become sensitive to the whole body. And we're still aware that the in-breath is an in-breath and the out-breath is an out-breath. So we can breathe in and that in-breath fills the entire body or we can be aware of this space that the body is, is taking up and also around the body a bit. And on the out breath, also being aware of the whole body. Then we invite the body to become more calm, more tranquil. As we're breathing in, and we're breathing out. Letting go of any stress or tension. 
tightness. Just feeling the whole body breathing. And the next instruction is to notice any pleasant feeling arising anywhere in the body. And this kind of feeling can have various kinds of qualities. It could be a bit of tingling or warmth or feeling of fullness. It might be quite subtle or it might be stronger. But it's an indication that spiritual energy is beginning to arise in us. It feels similar to the kind of feeling of walking into a sacred space, feeling the, the, the tone or the impression left by years of meditation or chanting or prayer. And the spiritual energy arises in us as we meditate and pay close attention to the breath, the body, and any of these pleasant feelings. The pleasant feeling becomes stronger the more our attention is focused. And if it arises in different places in the body, we can invite it to spread, connect. And if you don't notice any feelings in particular that are pleasant or rising from this focused attention, then just notice that it's pleasant just to be mindful. And those sensations can be quite subtle, but they're important to, to notice. Still aware of each in-breath and each out-breath. And whatever experience of pleasant feeling, joy, or happiness that might be there.
Sometimes these pleasant feelings can get quite strong. The PT, the word in Pali is PT. Sometimes translated as rapture. But often they're felt subtle in subtle ways. And then there's also sukha, a bit softer, calmer, more peaceful, pleasant feelings. These are all a natural result of being mindful and present, moving towards samadhi towards still, stillness of the mind. We notice any activity that's happening in the mind. Still aware we're breathing in, aware we're breathing out. And for whatever activity is happening in the mind, thoughts, we invite them to become calm and peaceful, to drift away as if they're written on water. And we maintain our awareness, our focus on breathing in and breathing out. And when the thoughts are calm, we take some notice of the mind itself. What is its mood? Is it tight or expansive? Is it relaxed? Or contracted? Do we experience any greed there or hatred or delusion? Or is it calm and at ease? In whatever state the mind is in, invite it to become happier, more glad, elevated. You could bring to mind thoughts of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the enlightened Sangha, 
the spiritual friendship that encourages you to make progress on the spiritual path, all the good fortune that you have to even come in contact with the Buddha's teachings. Whatever it is that lifts up the heart, bringing more and more joy to the mind, more and more happiness, spiritual happiness to the mind. It's the happy mind that's easily concentrated, that comes to stillness that is bright and alert, but calm and clear. Samadhi. Remember to stay focused on the in-breath and the out-breath. Even as the mind becomes deeply tranquil and content, without wanting anything, without wanting to get rid of anything, just at peace and at ease, alert, and observant of whatever arises from the deeper reaches of the mind.
Now at some point, <clears throat> at some point, the mind is finished with concentration. And when it releases itself from that state of stillness, that's a very good time to reflect on impermanence. All mental states are impermanent. All states of the body are impermanent. And all conditions in life are impermanent. And when we take this truth in very, very deeply, then our longing and craving, our clinging fade. The attraction of having and holding on to anything fades. And this happiness that comes from meditation, from mindfulness, from stillness, this is definitely more satisfying than external things. So we notice the ending of things, the cessation of craving and clinging, desire to have and the desire to get rid of. And the peace that that brings, not wanting anything not wanting to get rid of anything. Even any kind of self concept or attainment or identification. To be free from that, all of that. And experience release, relinquishment, letting go. This is the final step in mindfulness of in and out breathing. Letting go.
excuse me. So I hope that was um, useful. So I thought I'd share some thoughts with you about joy and happiness. And you, you may have noticed and you may have a lot of experience already with those instructions I led you through. <clears throat> and there are actually three out of the 12 that are focused on some kind of joy or happiness, joy, happiness, pleasant feeling, gladness. And when I, when I started to really look into the Buddhist teachings, I was very surprised to see how much he emphasized joy, happiness, and pleasant feeling. Of course, he was guiding people to shift away from finding their pleasure in sense objects because he knew that those would lead to disappointment eventually. But he was encouraging us to have those experiences that are filled with spiritual pleasant feeling. And he talked about um, these different things in their in Pali terms, PT and Sukha and Pamoja, <clears throat> excuse me, different ways, different words for joy, happiness, pleasant feeling. And they're um, mentioned in many, many places always in descriptions of how to settle the mind and becoming concentrated, going deep into samadhi, always has this, you know, PT involved in it. And so it's, it's valuable, extremely valuable to develop our ability in bringing those feelings forward, paying attention to them and experiencing them. And the Buddha talked often about how this kind of happiness is um, much superior to the kind of worldly happiness we experience when we get what we want. And it's also good to notice that it doesn't just come from meditation, these kinds of happiness or this spiritual um, pleasant feeling. It also comes from generosity, from um, being kind, being mindful. And I thought in particular today I would um, put a little extra attention on the Brahma Vihara, which is joy, mudita. And I find that all of these things are related. It's all, you know, the same kind of how do we lift up the heart and um, really uh, help the mind to be happy. And, you know, that, that definitely increases the, the potential for our spiritual development and, you know, in all areas, in, in our virtue and in our um, training of our mind and in wisdom. It's, it's just much more accessible when the mind is, is bright. Now, of course, the Buddha also talked a lot about dukkha, about suffering. Because when we're not in those uh, states of happiness and we're experiencing, inevitably experiencing dissatisfaction and suffering of various kinds, then that's always the indicator of, oh, now it's important to look and, and be present with that so that I can understand what that is, where it's coming from, what it's about, where's the clinging, um, what is, what is, what do I want to have be different than it is? And so that's, that's key. But then to know that, you know, the natural state of the mind is, is happiness, is peaceful, is joyful. And the Buddha says that, you know, when the 
when the taints or defilements, whatever you want to call them, those, those uh, things that cause us to contract and be full of fear or other negative or difficult feelings. And, and when those when those are washed away, you might say, what's left is, is peace and happiness. Now Mudita, as you know, is one of the four divine abidings and, you know, Metta gets all the press, usually the loving kindness and, and uh, of course, compassion also is, you know, extremely important and prevalent in our lives. And Upeka, the, uh, the fourth one is, is also, um, you know, part, really integral to our awakening and, um, having that evenness of mind, the, the wisdom factor of the four divine abidings. And Mudita, I think, gets a little bit of a short shrift, actually. But, um, but it's, it's, there's more to it than I think we think. A lot of times it's presented as the, the kind of remedy for jealousy. You know, if instead of being jealous that somebody got what you wanted, that um, you bring up, uh, you know, mudita, some gladness that they had this success. And then the jealousy goes away. And it is, it is true, it works. But I think mudita is so much more than that. Because when you get deeper into practicing with it, it's the way of feeling happy for everything that you see that's good. And I mean, good, like on a spiritual level, like keeping precepts, you see other people keeping precepts, you yourself keeping precepts, and we can have joy for that. You know, we, we see other people being generous. If we're, we're doing things that are generous, we can have joy for that. We can even have joy that we didn't react negatively the way we might have in the past, have joy for that progress a sense of gladness and happiness. And it can also be applied to worldly things to some extent, like being happy that someone is, you know, engaging in a wholesome business that helps people and they're making a success of it. You know, things like that. In other words, everywhere where we see goodness, we can bring up a sense of gladness of of happiness about that and when we do that you know it's it's very much it helps us um, see more of it see more goodness in more places see more um, shades of it it's like gratitude practice you know then you then you really see all the goodness in your life much more clearly um, we can see the goodness in ourselves. And this is where mudita comes in. We can, we can notice what we have done, even, the, even those things that we've avoided, like killing living beings or intentionally or um, saying something harsh, and, and we've avoided it. And then we can have gladness for that, mudita. Um, it starts to be really fun when the mudita arises kind of spontaneously when you see goodness. Like, you know, when people take precepts, mudita arises. <laughs> um, when we are gathering for Dhamma talk, mudita arises. You know, when you see a child help another child, Mudita arises. When you see anybody help somebody else, <laughs> Mudita arises. You know, it's, um, it, it can become a really wonderful habit. Um, feeling that joy and noticing that it's there, noticing how it feels in the body and knowing that it's a positive, beautiful spiritual quality.
Yeah, so I I um I really want to encourage this kind of a practice to reflect on the good. And we have so many things that pull us in the direction of reflecting on what's not good. What's frightening or wrong or selfish or greedy or hateful. And it colors our mind, it colors our life. So I think that, you know, of course, there's a lot of that in our, in our, the sense impressions that come our way because, um, you know, in some ways it gets, it makes us more excited. Where goodness doesn't have that same kind of um, impact. But as practitioners, we learn to appreciate peace and calm and happiness more than excitement. And I think because there's this tendency, they say also it's kind of built in to our nature to reflect on the things that go wrong or the mistakes or the dangers more because it has this tendency to keep the living organism alive. You know, you're more cautious or um, you're on warning, <laughs> but it doesn't make us happy. And I also think it, it causes us to contract and be less available to spiritual growth sometimes never know what might trigger um, insight, but there is, a, there is a benefit to really putting some conscious effort into practicing this uplift of the heart and seeing those things that really deserve that kind of response. All the ways in which we really show that we care for each other that we really are loving and kind, generous. And, and that, you know, the added sort of stepping back and reflecting upon that, another level of goodness, source of happiness and joy. So I'd like to just in my comments there and hear what you might think about that and any other questions you might want to ask. Are you wanting to say something, Sheila? I think you could either raise your hand with the hand raise function or unmute yourself. And did you want to say something, Amanda? Thank you, Aya. Um, it's lovely to see you again. I did a course with you through Barry Institute, telling you media, so thank you. You see my accent. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. So morning here. Um, well, good morning. <laughs> it's really lovely to be with you. Um, okay. Thank you for this. Um, I really love um, the Anapana Sati practice. Um, and it was very beautiful. And I'm just really interested Often Mudita's talked about, about this practice of joy for others. But I feel like you're saying, you know, it's also noticing it within um, the self as well. Yep. That's certainly been a really important practice over particularly the past time. Um, here where I live, we're in lockdown, a very strict lockdown. And we still 
um, very difficult conditions. Um, and there's been something about sm noticing small joy and I'm interested in your talking about this as goodness and I'm just really interested in this quality. Um, like sort of the difference between pity and sukha and mm -hmm. I just was interested in you talking about that a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, so the way I the way I experience PT is it it really has a spiritual energy. It's obviously a mental feeling, but it's I experience it in the body. And I think that that's really what, I mean, the Buddha will say things like, you know, with your body, you know, and that, so it can be experienced in a number of different ways, um, tingling, warmth, sometimes parts of the body feel like they're swelling, they become very diffuse. But I think it's also when you're in that kind of level of concentration you can also experience it through sound the sound feels diffuse or it rings through the body like you can feel it reverberate through the whole body i think that's also like there's a there's a pt aspect there that sound of silence in the ears or at least that's what ajahn Sumedho called it you know that kind of steady hum that's very kind of comforting and pleasant and if we settle in, it's available almost everywhere, as far as I can tell. I and mean, sometimes in the in the forests in Thailand, the the insects would be so loud you couldn't hear. <laughs> I couldn't hear it, but <clears throat> most of the time you can tune into it. And I think that's from my perspective. I believe that that's also another form of PT. It's like it's that subtle vibration that is a spiritual energy. And I think it, there's a, you know, like I said in the meditation, it seems to me like when you walk into a sacred space and you feel the vibe, I think that's kind of a, a, a PT vibe. And, you know, I think that the Buddha talked about PT and Sukha separately because they're a little bit different quality. And usually uh, the way it sounds that the Buddha used PT to describe the more, the fuller, more noticeable, more you know, a little coarser kind of feeling. And then as the mind becomes more settled, that becomes more subtle. And then that becomes like, there, then it's more the sukha that takes the front seat. But these things can be experienced together. It's just kind of a mixture of different, maybe a diff, little bit different facet, but a different value kind of, of, of um, intensity. You know, you might, if we, if we compare it to colors, you might think of it as, you know, like a really bright, Mm, kind of blue and then a softer lighter blue you know something like that that you can recognize that the the sukha is more refined when the pt fades away that very refined peaceful steady feeling is there the pt i mean the that would be the sukha the pt also according to um, I think it's in the Visuddhi Maga. PT can also be experienced like you're in you're in like um, the current of the ocean. You're in the waves and you're moving back and forth, and and it can have other kinds of experiences. Even light, I mean, when we see light, a lot of times I think it's really connected to PT. Just vibration in different channels. Now the Buddha doesn't say that, but that's how I experience experience it and um one time i asked um one of the monks in thailand Dajan Biak, if because sometimes they it's hard to get people to describe the way pt actually feels you don't quite know what they're talking about and so i've been 
asking teachers for years now, like how they experience PT. And I said, so if you're, if you're feeling this tingling, um, and then, you know, the body parts start disappearing, is that PT? And he said, the tingling is PT and the disappearing body parts is beyond PT. Just to kind of give you a gauge, okay? So the swelling, like your legs feel really huge or your hands feel really huge, or you, you know, that's a PT thing. And if there's a buzzing on the top of your head, I think that's a PT thing. And the, the point is sometimes you, people will say, oh, just ignore that stuff. That's just energy. But actually it comes from the spiritual experience. You don't want to ignore it. You want to spread it through the body. The way the Buddha talked about the PT in these metaphors of, you know, like um, um, the, man, the, the bath man with the powdered soap and he wets it and it becomes saturated and it's just fully saturated, but it doesn't drip. He said, have the PT go through the body all like that. Well, you can feel that with that kind of spiritual energy. But, you know, not everybody has the same kinds of sensitivities. So if it's, if it's really a calm, uplifting feeling, even if it's subtle, that counts, you know, like be present with that, notice it. See if you can invite it to expand, to become stable. And see if you can get um, good at touching into that kind of state, moving into that kind of state. So that's PT and Sukha. And then you have this idea of gladdening the mind later on after, after you've calmed the body and you've calmed the mind. So you have tranquility of the body, tranquility of the mind. And then you're looking at the, the sort of tone or mood of the mind itself. And then he says, gladden the mind. Whatever state you find the mind in, you lift it up even further. Because it's, it's the happy mind that's easily concentrated that goes into samadhi. And so just, you know, hopefully without having to think about it, but just inviting that, that uplift of the mind. So gladdening the mind. And then how does that relate to mudita? Well, personally, when I work with the Brahma Viharas, it feels to me like the energy of metta is very much like PT. Feels similar, very similar to me. Now, I don't know that that's true for other people, but I think that any of these qualities that are really, you know, lifting the heart, lifting the mind, um, they're going to have some relationships. And it might just be, you know, different ways of saying it. And energetically, it seems to me like all four Brahma Viharas are experienced a little bit differently. You know, they have a different feeling tone to them or a different sense in my experience. And so when you come to Mudita, there's a lightness. Um, it's, it's really happy, joyful. It's, it's really like, I am so glad that this person is doing this good thing or so glad that I am doing this good thing. And I think the more we recognize that there really isn't a, a viable identification of self to any of this here, these khandas, the more it's the same, whether I see it in someone else or I see it in myself. And so we, we should practice being happy for our own goodness and being, being happy for the good that we do. And, and when we are in the right way, it's certainly not an ego um, increaser. It's, it's, a, it's a humbling thing. You know, we, we can be congratulating our, our self, but it's our non-self. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, just seeing the goodness in ourselves. And, and I think in some ways when we do that, it helps us to let go of the self. 
the idea that, you know, me and my ego and me and my practice and me and my whatever, you know, because um, we don't have to, it's not about becoming something. It's just about noticing the good that's there and encouraging it. So we should encourage the good in everything, in everyone, and, and notice it and appreciate it and feel that, you know, invite that joy to arise. Yes, Sheila. So I now do have a question. Thank you so much for today's talk. So I, it's not a challenge, but I guess the, um, the, the instruction to find the goodness, happiness, even in the midst of those challenging and painful circumstances and um, conditions. So that's what arises from this talk is in the midst of whatever that condition is. Yeah, it still I means to lift that up. Yeah, I think uh, when we're experiencing challenges, when we're experiencing hardship, when we're experiencing dukkha of any kind, um, it's not like we just like jump to joy because that would be a spiritual bypassing action that's not going to get us anywhere. We don't want to, we don't want to like try to just cover it over. We need to look at it. So the first step always when we are experiencing any form of dukkha, you know, what comes from, you know, losing what we love or being a, having to deal with what we don't like or, you know, all the different things, the aging, sickness, death, you know, all the different things that cause dukkha, dissatisfaction of various kinds. The, we have to first and foremost use the first noble truth. You turn towards it. You acknowledge that it's there. And then you work with understanding it. And of course, that requires mindfulness. And, and when we talk about the Brahma Viharas, the appropriate Brahma Vihara for that is equanimity to whatever degree we can uh, let the mind be unmoved, even if the body's falling apart or everything around us is falling apart. I mean, again, we don't want to like just put on a happy face and act like, oh, I'm equanimous. Most of the time, if we haven't done the work of being with that dukkha and understanding it deeply and where it's rooted, that's just like a, a cover, a band-aid, a facade. So we don't want to do that. We got to be real. We have to be real with ourselves and we have to be real in the world. Otherwise, we're not going to make progress. And so the joy comes later in that case. We got to do the work of being with the, the suffering first. And it doesn't mean you hang on to the suffering, you don't cling to it. You got to like let it move, let it change. And we, it's a matter of looking at what do I, what do I want to have be different? What am I clinging to? Um, and of course, we're clinging to all kinds of things. We live, we're human beings. We, we live in this world, and, and this is exactly what we, what we want to learn um, how to let go. And then we can have joy for the letting go. We can have joy for whatever. Honorable, honorable thing we did in the midst of that crisis and that, and that dukkha. Whatever generosity we had in the thick of things, you know, we can have joy for that. But it's not instantaneous usually in the middle of it. The Brahma Viharas are one of them, at least, is always applicable 
but not all of them are applicable all the time. You know, you don't have joy for somebody doing wrong things, for example. And one of, one of the important aspects of joy is that it's a karmic intensifier. So if we, if we do bad things with joy, it makes the karma worse. You can kind of feel how that is, right? If somebody takes delight in harming, it makes the karma worse. Now, if we take delight in good things, we take delight in giving, it makes the, the karma better. It, the, the good karma from doing that is even better because of our joy. So it's a karmic intensifier. You're welcome. What else you got? <laughs> Does this go till 3.30? We got lots of time? No, three o'clock. Okay. Just checking. But there's still time. Okay, should you have more questions or comments? Complaints are also okay. Anne? <laughs> Hi there. Um, thank you for your talk today. Uh, I I, uh, I truly enjoyed um, the meditation. It's it's been a while since I've had a guided, a guided um, you know meta kind of a feeling into a samadhi concentration. It just felt like it was combined, and I really appreciated mm -hmm. that. And I, I was trying to. It's the first time in a long time I've tried to identify PD, and not really found it. So I was really excited to at the opportunity to really look observe and and uh and see where it was hiding you know where's that where's that pd hiding <laughs> and you know it didn't really come out so then when you mentioned that it can be really subtle i suddenly i could feel i could feel a little like extra like softness in the shoulders mm -hmm. and i started to like tune into that and then and then that that then tended to suffuse you know, more throughout the body, and and I thought that was that was really nice. That was good. That was a good experience to have to have to really look look for it without actually wanting it or craving it, but looking for it. And and so that was really excellent. And then and then though it it, it occurred to me I wanted to ask. This is a question. Um, that I just thought of earlier today about if there's a connection or if, you, if you're if you aware, if there's a connection between the feeling of PT and the body and what I've I started to read a little bit about Kundalini energy. And if that's, if that's similar, is that the same thing? Or, or do you really need to be in a Samadhi practice to call it PT? Um, and that's my question. And then I have another uh, question afterward. Okay. So, so the, um, as far as I know, Kundalini doesn't show up in the Pali canon in the, in the, mm. at least in the suttas. And it's certainly an energetic experience of a spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and from what I know of it, which is, not a lot, but it can be really quite dramatic. Right. Kundalini is, you know, and, ooh. Um, <laughs> ooh, yeah. And so, you know, in different traditions, different things are emphasized and different things come forward. But at the bottom line, we're all working with the same spiritual material. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say it has to be related, but it probably comes out in different ways, depending on a, the way one cultivates and the, the 
kind of mental conditioning we have. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I had started to feel some things without practice. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I just would wake up in the morning and feeling energetic joy, right? Without mm-hmm. any practice. And I'm like, well, what is that? And that's what got me into, into searching, you know, Google's amazing. Um, so, (laughs) okay. So, um, I agree with that too. I think, you know, that, that, that actually makes sense to me. They're just different practices and different emphases and different ways to look at it. Cause I don't think it's really PD is supposed to lead to Sukha to the next, to the fourth. Right. And, and if, if you're just, you know, waking up suffused with joy for some reason or excitement you know then or energy then that's not the same thing um and then my next question is that statue behind you i i don't believe i've ever seen i've ever seen a statue like that can you tell me something about that statue and do you sell does your does your little monastery sell little copies of that like some of the (laughs) others do no Uh we wouldn't sell them i don't think but um um this statue was made in Malaysia in um, okay. um, Butterworth, Penang. And there's a store there uh, called Meow <laughs> um, that has them. And I, I don't know if they have smaller versions than this one, uh, but we... Uh, we were offered, someone wanted to fundraise to get us a, a larger Buddha stature than we had for a number of years while we were in existence. And, and this was intended, is intended for our meditation hall somewhere. Now it's at the Hermitage where um, it's a bit, it's, it's impressive in this small room. But <laughs> so, um, so we, we started to think about, well, what kind of Buddha image would we want and we saw pictures of this one on the internet but we had no idea where to find it and then we did a pilgrimage that we this is Aya Chetananda and myself were the two Bakuni residents here and um and the ones who are building the monastery I guess you could say and um and so we went on pilgrimage to Sri Lanka and there's this lovely museum in Kandy, a Buddhist museum, and they have uh, separate rooms for each like country. Like you, you have the, the mm. Japan room and the China room and all the Buddhist, different Buddhist countries. And there was the Malaysia room and there was a, a photograph of this statue on the wall. And they said where it had been made and that gave us enough of a clue. And then we have um, one of our community member supporters is, um, is from Malaysia and she got her sister involved and they found, anyway, it was, she actually Hers. looked at YouTube videos of her teacher giving talks in different places and found it in some meditation hall in Malaysia. And, um, and Wonderful. then sent me, sent us photos with a whole row of them. <laughs> from the mm-hmm. shop <laughs> so that's how it came to us oh well that's a that's a great story too um you know to to have put that much effort and energy into finding just the right um yeah. icon you know for your and um i don't know how well you can see it but it it has it doesn't really have an ethnic it's it's ethnically ambiguous and it's also slightly androgynous, which we really like. And it, if you yeah. look at it from the right, from its right side, it looks more masculine. If you look at it from its left side, it looks more feminine and uh, uh, seemed just looks, right for us. <laughs> what? Yeah, this angle that I'm at, it looks pretty feminine. Mm-hmm. So I was liking, I was liking the, you know, the slimmer cheeks there quite mm-hmm. a lot. So, okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that story. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> and the, and the energy you know you're getting. I know. I know. The, the stories of how monasteries and meditation halls get their, get their Buddha statues can be super interesting. I've, I've seen a few of them now. And, uh, and thank you for adding to my collection. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.
Well, it's three o'clock and um, so I guess it's time, right, Noam? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to say a few things if, if um, but if you want to say final things or should I say my things and then you say your things? Yeah, you say your things and then okay. I think I'll chant a blessing. <laughs> okay, everyone. sounds great. So the first thing I have to say is thank you so much. This was really a beautiful afternoon. Thank you for the sit. Thank you for the teachings. It was um, fantastic. I appreciate it. And I know everyone else does too. I think everyone else does. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat, again, for those of you who don't know or came late, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. and. Um, we are delighted to host the Loka Viharanans and today to have our guests, Ayas and Tusika. Um, and we are, uh, our, our Sangha and our teaching and our, our teachers are entirely dependent on uh, Donna. So I'm putting a link in the chat for that you're invited to share any resources that you can. If you cannot, then you are still more than welcome to be here. Your presence is is a form of dana, and um, you're you're welcome regardless of your financial situation. But if you can support um, the nuns and the collective, that would be wonderful. We have a newsletter that comes out every week, and the link is in there if you'd like to sign up for it. And also, many of our classes are archived on our YouTube channel, um, including most of the nun nun. Um, Dharma talks. Um, we have a lot of things coming up next weekend. It's a kind of a packed special weekend. We have regular classes almost every day of the week. You can go to um, SF Dharma Collective. In fact, I should just put the link in there. I don't think I have it ready, but it's um, SF Dharma Collective. Dot org. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, but if you click on coming up, you'll see that next weekend we have four special events. We have on Friday afternoon, we have the first of a new weekly class series that is a support group for educators. It's called um, uh, Mindfulness and Stress Resilience for Educators. And it's a 45 minute class. If you know any educators, they all need help. <laughs> They're like, the level of stress in their lives is unbelievable. And uh, so we're starting this uh, 45 minute Friday afternoon group every uh, starting this coming Friday. Friday night, our uh, one of our regular teachers, Michael Owens, is offering uh, one of his visual Buddhism classes. Um, he's a sutra uh, scholar and he periodically teaches something with like this whole slideshow and, and this time it's a cos Buddhist cosmology. It's part three of a series he's doing on Buddhist cosmology on the Avatamsaka Sutra. So that should be amazing. And then on Saturday, we have our monthly queer Sangha. That's a peer led group. Uh, that's in the afternoon at 530. And on Sunday, we have the Dharma of Intimacy with Dr. Andrea Vecchioni. She teaches that once a month. So that's a lot next weekend. Um, and yeah, check out some of our regular classes too, if you've never been. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Noam. Thank you, everyone. Mudita arises for all those good Dharma offerings. I gotta say, <laughs> this is great. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing up there. And, um, I'm from Karuna Buddhist Vihara, sister monastery to Aloka Vihara and, um, yeah, if you if you want to, um, you know, sometime visit the Santa Cruz Mountains, let us know. So I want to chant a blessing for all of you and everyone. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Buddhas, may you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you. By the power of all the Dhamma, may you ever be well. 
May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the sangha. May you ever be well. Take good care of yourselves.